Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Money and Metals Network Coin Talk. Today, I have the pleasure of introducing Carl Savage from the National Treasure Trove Unit based at the National Museum Scotland. Carl is an expert in medieval and post medieval numismatics with a focus on Scotland and Northern England. His recent work includes a groundbreaking die study and new classification of the early coinage of David II. Carl has published widely on medieval numismatics and presented at major conferences like the International Medieval Congress. His doctoral research, conducted at the University of York and National Museum Scotland, was submitted earlier this year, titled Coinage, Landscape and Society in the Borderlands, where Carl examined the economic and political roles of coinage in Scotland and Northern England between 1136 and 1603. As usual with these talks, please post any questions you might have in chat, and Carl and I will go through them together at the end. So without further ado, I will hand you over to Carl Savage. Thank you very much for that introduction, Campbell. So um, today's talk is just a very sort of nice introduction to the Scottish coinage. Um, so I'm not going to go into any into too much detail about different classifications or any anything like that. Um, I'll be showing you lots of pretty pictures and I'll be um, taking you through on a journey of this first part of the Scottish coinage. Um, so this is part one. Um, so this will cover um, the Scottish coinage from King David the first to Robert the second. Um, so I shall get started with um, a very, very basic layout of this uh, of the first Scottish coinage of. Um, um, so this is an so this example on the slide here is an example of a coin of David the first. And this little layout just kind of like shows you um, the basic layout of what we generally see on these um, early Scottish coins. So on the obverse, we have a crowned bust, either facing uh, left or right. And this is generally, uh, this has a scepter in front of the bust. Um, and the legend and the legend around with, on the obverse generally reads the name of the king. In this case, it would be David Rex. And also we also have blundered legends as well, which I'll come into more detail a bit later. And on the ob on the reverse, we normally have the reverse design of the craw uh, of the coin, which can feature numerous different types, and I'll show you um, those examples later on. The legend on the reverse features the name of the money and the mint, and always starts with an initial cross, which is generally uh, placed at round about twelve o'clock. Um, of course, these layouts um, do change on with various types. And, and the period of Scottish coins that we are looking at. So the first Scottish coinage um, was actually initiated um, under David I. Now, David was King of Scots since 1124, but on the death of his patron and br brother-in-law, Henry I, in 1135, David sneakily took control of Carlisle and Northern Cumbria, and with it, he gained, gained control of the Carlisle Mint and the surrounding silver and lead sources. And this working mint actually allowed David to begin the production of the first Scottish coins. Um, so I'll talk, I'll talk you through um, the, the basic chronology of um, David's coins in a bit. But first, um, I should just give you an overview of the known mints that were active under King David the first. So Carlisle was the first one. And then we've, we've, and then Aberdeen is un, uncertain. There is one coin that was in the Studeby collection that was supposed, supposed from Aberdeen, but that is the only specimen that is known su supposedly from Aberdeen. We also have Berwick. We also have Edinburgh, Perth, Roxburgh, and St. Andrews. Now, to make matters more complicated, David's son, Earl Henry of Northumberland and Huntington, also minted his uh, own coins in his name. And, he, and David and Earl Henry minted jointly from Carlisle. Earl Henry also minted um, coins in, in his own name from Bamburgh, from Corbridge and Newcastle in the name of um, King Stephen. 
And um, it's also worth noting that both David and Earl Henry also minted coins in the name of King Stephen from the Carlisle Mint. And Henry also minted um, coins in Stephen's name later from the Bambra Mint, as well as um, Newcastle. So the next, this slide um, is detailing the very first pipes of um, David the first. And so David's very first coins um, copied the English types. So for example, Henry the first type 15 and Stephen type one, of which these two examples um, on the slides uh, show. So the first one is imitating um, uh, Henry the first type 15 in the name of King David. So we can see on the obverse image, it has the remnants of David. Um, so that that will say in full uh, David Rex. And of course, we can see from the reverse that this was minted in Carlisle. Again, on the other one, on the, the other coin is the um, imitating of Stephen type one. So this is a cross Moline and uh, list type with list in the angles. Again, this was minted in Scotland. So from one of David's first mints that he set up in Scotland proper was Edinburgh. And this is by the uh, this coin example here was minted by the money at Derrind, who also minted in various other types as well. So these were the first coins of, of David, the first very Scottish coins copying the English type. We also have another type um, which broadly copies um, Henry the First's type 12, um, which, cop uh, which is the annulets and pellets. Um, it's also worth noting that there is some variety in this annulet and pellet um, type, that sometimes the annulets are actually crescents. So we have crescents rather than annulets. And again, um, this example was minted by Derrand at the mint of Roxburgh. And it was and this type of coin, uh, the crescent, the pellets and annulets type were also minted at Carlisle and um, Perth as well. But with um, David's main coins, his main type is the cross flurry and pellets um, type. Um, I've got, and I show on, on this slide, I've got numerous examples here of this cross flurry type. Um, so this was his main type. We minted at Carlisle, uh, Berwick and uh, Roxburgh, and also smaller mints at St. Andrews and the sole specimen of Aberdeen was this cross flurry type. Um, and as we can see here from the examples on the slide, it's not just pellets we have in the angles. We also have a various different combinations of symbols. So we can have, um, for example, the pellets can be attached to stalks. We have examples of where it, it's um, two pellets in corresponding angles and then two stalks. Other times we have just stalks. And then we also have various other symbols in the legends as well, sorry, in the angles as well, such as various annulets and also stars and also rosettes and also a combination of pellets. So it's a lot of it's a lot of variety in this cross flurry type. And we also get um, the blundered the coins the David the first coins with blundered legends so that is basically nonsensical legends or the legends where we can't we can't read what's going on we can't read the the leg the legends and um, so we don't particularly know where where these were issued in terms of a basic chronology of um, of these David the first coins. It's the it is the types that copy the English types is generally the first ones that were issued, and we're probably thinking that the current research suggests that they might have continued certainly into the late 1140s, and then the cross flurry types um, were produced probably in the name of David af in the later 1140s through to the 1150s, and probably also issued in the reign of Malcolm the Fourth and possibly also in the early reign of William the first but unfortunately no detailed die study of these um, David the first coins has yet been undertaken so the exact chronology of um, of these coins is still 
still needs to be um, still needs to be worked out. Um, the current the current in, one of the current interpretations is that the blundered legends of the cross flurry type were issued after David had died. Um, but it's also quite possible that these blundered legends were still issued while David was still alive. Um, so at this at this point, it's, it's also probably good to say that um, these coins were generally produced to the same standard as the corresponding English coins. But recent silver testing has um, shown that the coins of David the first minted from the Scottish mints were of a slightly uh, low, had a slightly lower silver content than the than the coins that David and Earl Henry were issuing from Carlisle, and that will put then that and that um, and that for, forms will form the diff uh, a topic of an entirely different talk. So I will I will stop there on on the silver. On the silver analysis, and then move on to actually looking at um, some of the Earl Henry coins that he also um, that were also issued alongside um, David the first. So Earl Henry's types basically follow the same basic design as as has, as his father, King David, that it has a crowned bust either facing left or right with a scepter, but the legend around the coins where the, when this is legible actually um, names Henry as Count of North as Earl of Northumberland, Northumberland rather than as King of Scots as it does on David's coins. Um, so Henry's um, types again are very broadly similar to, to David's. Um, so his first types uh, were the Cross Moline and lists and angles uh, type. So he, Henry issued these from Corbridge, of which one of these examples on the slide is, and also um, Carlisle. Again, they also issued this uh, type in the name of Stephen from, from Carlisle as well, and from Newcastle. And um, so this example on the slide was by the Munier Erebold, who is quite an interesting character because he was also a Carlisle Munier under David, and he also ran uh, the minting operations early in David reigns at Edinburgh and the and Earl Henry's mint at Corbridge. So we see Erebold at Carlisle, Corbridge, and um, Ed and Carlisle and Edinburgh. And the other sort of main type of Earl Henry is another sort of variant of um, of David's uh, cross. Uh, cross flurry type but this this time it generally doesn't have any any symbols in the angles of the of the cross so it's generally um a cross a cross flurry only but with metal detecting um finds uh, new varieties of these coins are coming up all the time and we do have one or two examples of king david that has a cross flurry with nothing in the angles. So whether that is a David Earl Henry uh, mule, we don't know yet, and it requires further research. And the other main type of Earl Henry that um, was on, and this is the cross crosslets type, and this was only issued from the Bambra Mint. Um, so this was issued in um, Earl Henry's name and also in the name of Stephen as well. Um, so all these, so it was in, in, it's interesting to note that Earl Henry, despite being the Rex Designatus so, of Scotland, so that is basically the heir to the Scottish throne, did not issue any coins from mints in, Scot in Scotland proper. All the, co all the coins that were minted from mainland Scotland were in the name of David. Indeed, um, the Butte Hoard, um, discovered in the late 19th century, contains at least two coins of Earl Henry, of which are now in the NMS collections. So um, moving on to um, from David and Earl Henry, we now um, look at the coinage of David's grandson and successor to the Scottish throne, Malcolm IV. So Malcolm's, Malcolm's coins do also um, have similar um, uh, types to David I. So we have uh, cross flurries with various types of um, symbols in the angles, such as pellets, rosettes, 
And also, um, we have a new design on the obverse as well. So with David and Earl Henry's, they were always um, depicted either facing left and right with a scepter. On some of the types of Malcolm IV, we now actually have a facing bust with two scepters either side. And also some of the reverse designs um, change as well. So we get quite complex designs. And um, so the, the, how Malcolm IV coins are divided is based on is based on the sort of the, the obverse bust and the reverse design too. And the only known active mints of Malcolm are Berwick and Roxburgh. Um, it's also fair to say that Malcolm IV coins are extremely rare and they come up very, very rarely from the archaeological record. Um, also, uh, Malcolm's coins, also when they're legible, also name him, have his name in the obverse legend as well. But again, with Malcolm's reign, with Malcolm's coins, we do see blundered legends of them as well. And I have shown you some very nice and um, pretty pictures, but more often than not, when these coins come up from the archaeological record, they are often indecipherable and illegible. Um, so we can't pinpoint exactly, um, you know, what where they were minted or their, or their money is. Again, there's been no detailed work on the coins of Malcolm IV, um, so we don't know an exact chronology of um, of Mal Malcolm's types, or the or the orders of um, of the orders of dyes. Again, so further research on this could include um, silver testing to look at um, the um, sort of the silver sources and lead sources of the uh, of these coins as well. Then that can maybe sort of. Uh, give maybe a bit of indication of um, potentially when these coins, uh, when and where these coins were, were minted. And so moving on now from Malcolm, we move on to William the Lion. So Malcolm's younger brother who succeeded him as King of Scots in 1165. And William's reign is quite interesting. Um, not only was it quite long, as we shall see, he also had lots of different types of coins. Um, and these are divided into first, second and third co uh, coinages. And I shall um, detail these as as we go through the um, as we go through the types. So to start with, his first coinages um, are kind of made up of, of at least um, two main types. So, his so it's the first coinage and then the intermediate coinage. So his first coinage um, takes the um, is based on the reverse design of a cross with lists in the angles, and it's generally a um, crown bust facing right with a scepter. You know, very similar to what we see on the David the First coins. Um, again, these are in the name of William, and as we can see here from the images, um, these coins when they are found they are often in not very good condition. Um, so where the mints and money is are, it's often hard to kind of like pin pinpoint them. But from previous research and other collections, we know that the known, the current current known active mints in William's first coinages, what is Berwick and Roxburgh. So the two main um, border mints, again, that we saw that were active under Malcolm the fourth, and also David the first. And so William's other type in his first coinages, the intermediate type, um, features this um, new design, um, which is a which is a lozenge on a cross with um, a cross of uh, five pellets on the reverse. And generally, with this type, the intermediate B type, it generally has a crown bust facing left. Um, again, new varieties such as um, this one are coming up all the time um, because we don't know a great deal about this coinage as of yet. We don't know if these new varieties are a new type of intermediate issue or are the mules between two existing types. Um, it's one that requires more fines, basically. And what we really need of this period is a big hoard. 
uh, to uh, to hopefully where we get lots of lots of types and we can also um, uh, shed more light on the circulation of these coins as well. Um, as with um, the Malcolm the Fourth coins, these early coins of William are extremely rare. Um, but thanks to metal detecting, more are starting to come up. But in 1170, we now move on to um, Scotland's very first substantial coinage. Um, so this was um, so this coinage under William was the was the first one that was produced of a standard design over a long period of time, whereas previously under David I, Malcolm and and early William, the coin types have been small and their designs have been very, very sporadic um, with lots of different varieties. Um, this type of coinage, the, the immobilized coinage, um, produced to one set design over a long um, period of time. Yes, um, with the with William's second coinage, the Crescent coinage, there is um, there is vari different varieties which um, Tim Crafter in his PhD thesis has divided into um, five main types, but I will not go into them today um, as that's that's too much detail. But the basic design of um, one of William's um, Crescent coins is basically a single cross dividing the center of the reverse and in each angle there is a crescent with a pellet and some varieties of of these have um, stalks attaching to the pellets uh, and then different forms of crescents as well so some of them could be quite tight some of them could be quite broad some of them can be quite crude but the basic design is is basically a crescent a pellet and a crescent in each angle and unfortunately, these coins were also quite poorly produced, um, as we can see from the um, from the images um, here. And um, again, sometimes we have um, we can't pinpoint exactly who the who the mint and money are moneyers are, but we're starting to see in this coinage a greater number of mints becoming in operation. So we have Berwick. Dunn, which is probably Dunfermline, Edinburgh and Perth active in this coinage, oh, and also Roxburgh too. But we also have now the phenomenon of no mint names on these coinage, these uh, these coins. And this is basically the money is name only. So we have um, various combinations. So we have full pulp, uh, just full pulp's name. We also have um, the money at Randolphson, and um the very and various other combinations like that as well um often with colons or stops between each letter um we can have a guess at maybe where these um these coins with no mint names were, min were minted based on the moneyers that that were named on them where they were active um chances are they were probably act uh, minted mostly at Roxburgh or Perth and again, Tim Crafter has done um, detailed analysis on, on these coins. And it's interesting to note as well, with these um, Crescent coins, um, for our English audience, um, we will not expect to find these in England. Um, these coins do not circulate in England. In fact, the only one recorded example is um, from a site in uh, North Wales of where it is just a fraction of um, of one of these coins. So the reason why these coins do not circulate in England, the current interpretation is, is that these coins were produced to a different standard compared to the corresponding English coins of the period, and um, this and this was um, and this was carried and detailed research on the metallurgy the metal content of the coins of the crescent coins of William and the corresponding cross and crosslet coins of Earl, of um, Henry the second um, sure that they were of, of different standards. Now the crescent coins um, circulated in Scotland. Most, most of these finds currently single finds are coming up from the Scottish borders, uh, the border regions. Um, but it's worth noting that a large hoard from the 19th century 
um, was found in northern Scotland that is said to have contained um, large numbers of these coins. But again, like the earlier 12th century uh, coins, we basically need a big hoard of these coins to um, shed more light on their wider circulation patterns. We know from hoards, um, uh, from single fires, that these coins were found in um, Ireland and also further afield in Scandinavia as well. So um, their circulation wasn't as limited to Scotland, but they did enjoy circulations you know, further afield, except England. But in now we move on to the um, the sort of kind of Williams main type, um, which is the um, short cross and stars coinage. Um, so which was introduced in circa 1195 and ran right the way through to 1250. And this is kind of a landmark in the history of Scottish coins as for the first time, conformity was reached with the, the corresponding um, short cross coins of England. So that means that the Scottish coins were produced to the same weight and, and had the same silver content as, um, as the English coins, which meant that they started circulating in greater numbers in England. And indeed, these coins are quite commonly found in in England and not and widely and more widely field as well. So they're present in England in sing, as single finds and hoards. So why are these coins called the short cross and stars? As you can see from the the layout on the reverse, it is formed by um, a double short cross, and in each angle there is a star. And um, these, these, the point, the number of points on the stars in this coin, uh, on this, in this coinage, can range from six points on each star to seven to five. So there's a lot of different various combinations of points on these stars in this coinage. And um, again, on this, on this coinage, the basic layout it names the mint and the money on the reverse, or in some cases as we'll see um, later on, it just names the um, the money. Um, so what do we know about the short cross and stars coinage? We, the known active mints for this coinage are Berwick, Edinburgh, Perth and Roxburgh. And, we all, and as we saw in the Crescent coinage, the earlier under William, we also have um, no mint names. So it's just the money is that are listed. And the most common um, moneyers um, in combination are Hugh and Walter. So this is the Edinburgh and the Perth uh, moneyers combining um, with them, the minting operations. And they're probably minted at Edinburgh, Perth, and also probably Roxburgh as well. Um, but we don't know, again, we don't know a great deal about the minting operations in this period of the Scottish coinage, unfortunately. So we don't know why that decision was taken to um, bring this, the minting operation under under the under the two moneyers. Maybe it was quality control. Um, we 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 don't we don't know or greater or greater control over the coinage. We we don't know as a, as of yet. So the um, short cross and stars coinage um, is currently divided into five different phases: phase A to E, and um, and these are sort of kind of divided based on stylistic grounds. Um, so I shall talk you through these, and I'll show you some examples. So um, oh, I'll go back. So phase A is generally in the name of William with the legend Willemus Rex and the, and there is various variations in that in that reading as well and the bust type is often quite crude and then when we get to um phase B which is the main type um so this was issued um during the later part of William and also <laughs> excuse me after um William had died so in under Alexander, but in the name of William. So these phase B coins um, generally have the 
the legend on the obverse, Le Ray Willam, or, or, or various um, combinations of that reading. And generally, the rule for the phase B coins is that um, there is generally no mint name on these coins. So we often just see the money as names. So, for example, in these examples, in these two, the two top examples, so we have Hugh Walter. We also have um, Henry, Le, Henry LaRousse. Um, so that's how, and these coins were issued, the phase B coins were, the current, the current um, hypothesis is that they commenced in 1205 when there was a partial recoinage in England and commenced and continued to circa 1230, where we start to see um, a change in the design of the, of the coins. So the, the bottom example is a coin issued under Alexander II, but in the name of William I. So we can still see on this, on the obverse, it's still in the name of William. So it's either Le Ray Willam or Willemus Rex. And we still see the same um, um, combination of uh, moneyers. So we, um, but also the mints start to be named on this one. So this example name the uh, the money is uh, Paris and, and Adam, but also the letter R for the mint of Roxburgh. But one of the defining characteristics of uh, the phase C coins, even though they're in the name of William, is if you look at the bust, we see that the busts are, are much better, are starting to become much better produced compared to the cruder portraits that we're seeing earlier on in the phase A and the phase and the phase B coins. So this, these phase C coin uh, portraits are, rem are starting to be more reminiscent of what we see under the coins of Alexander II in his own name. So these examples show um, phase D of the short cross and, and stars coins under Alexander. So these, um, we can see the, the portraits, the busts are much more realistic looking, they're much better produced. Uh, than the earlier ones, um, so these and these coins are all in the name of Alexander, and the current hypothesis is that this kind of commenced in circa 1235, and they continued until Alexander's death in 1249. Again, with under Alexander II, the only known active mint was Roxburgh. So at this period, under Alexander II, minting becomes confined to uh, Roxburgh. We also have um, later on in the uh, Alexander, in the phase D coins, we also have the Mint of Berwick um, opening up again as well. And the short cross of stars actually comes to an end in 1250. When Alexander II died, he was, he was succeeded by his young son, Alexander III. And the very final phase, phase E, actually depicts this um, this this child king of Alexander the Third of a young beardless bust. Unfortunately, this image of um, um, is not is not great. Um, again, the phase E coins are probably one of the rarest of the short cross of stars coinage, and um, and when they do come up from the archaeological record. Um, they're not often in the in the greatest condition. Um, so the mint for this this example here, this coin was minted at Berwick. It's also worth, um, as I mentioned earlier, that conformity was reached in 1195 with um, the English coins, and Scottish coins started to follow the English designs in in more detail. And in 1247. England initiated the um, double long cross uh, coins, replacing the short cross coins. And in Scotland, in 1250, they followed, um, um, Alexander III's government also followed suit and introduced what's now known today as the double long cross and stars coins, which is basically um, a double long cross dividing the entire reverse of the coin with a star in each angle. So again, this the same basic layout is very similar to what we see in the short cross and stars coinage. 
it names the mint and the money on the reverse and of course the obverse has a crown bust facing either left or right with a scepter in front and there are a lot of sort of different varieties in the bust in the bust style which i won't go um into today um so um so this long cross and this double long cross and stars coinage alexander's the third's first coinage sort of ran from 1250 to 1280 again these are relatively common finds both in england and in scotland so they were produced to the same um weight and silver standards as england and we see these um circulating outside of the british isles as well so um it's also interesting that during this period um of the double long cross and stars coinage this there was a large number of mints in operation in fact it was during this period that this saw the largest number of mints in operation for the um for um for a scottish coinage um and as we can see on the slide it lists the known active uh, mints that were producing coins at various of various types in this coinage unfortunately um the exact dating and chronology of um these the various types is not is still not fully uh, fully known um we can we can maybe say that the younger the earlier classes with the younger style busts were probably starting at, you know were probably early but you know as we go through as we go through the various um eight classes we're not entirely sure which ones um the exact dates of of the chronology of 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 these um coins so generally we know that they were produced sometime between 1250 and 1280 at, at these um at these various mints and often as well um um sometimes these coins can be quite hard to read as well especially on the especially on the reverse um when the lettering and the engraving can be sometimes quite poor and also when the coins of themselves are in not in particularly good condition and now um we move on to alexander's the alexander's um single long cross and stars coinage so in 1279 in England, Edward I introduced um, the single cross coinage with um, three pellets in each angle. And in 1280, Alexander followed suit by introducing the um, the single cross. But in this, in each angle, it has a combination of either mullets or stars and mullets. And, it, and it's also good to probably point out the difference between what is a mullet and what is a star. So in this example on the slide on this reverse, we see a star in the first and the third angles and a mullet in the second and the fourth. So the mullet is basically a pierced star, whereas the star is unpierced. Though sometimes on some die types of um, this type, um, we do have um, worn dies where they are mullets, but the piercing's worn and it could look like a, um, it could like look like a star. But generally, the, the points on mullets are generally thicker than they are on on stars as well. Is another useful way to um, to uh, to differentiate them. And it's also and it's also um, interesting to note as well that in 1280, alongside this new coins coinage, um, Alexander also introduced a round half penny and farthing. Now, previously, under David I William, and to um, 1280, the um, Scottish coins, um, the pennies, were cut into halves or quarters in order to make small change. Now, in 1280, in Scotland, this process, like in England in 1279, this process of cutting coins into halves and quarters was made illegal and instead um, whole round half pennies and farthings were produced at the mints alongside the the pennies and this um so these coins in alexander these single cross coins in alexander's name continued after his death 
1286, and they probably continued right up until 1292, when John Balliol was um, basically selected as King of Scots. Um, so this slide just shows uh, various examples of um, this new um, type, this new single uh, cross coinage of Alexander III. Um, so what we can see here is that the coins are much neater. The busts are also much neatly, more, more neatly produced and more realistic looking. Um, again, interestingly, on these coinage, um, there is no um, mint names. Instead, there is the legend Rex Scotorum. The current hypothesis is that um, the number of points on the mullets or, or stars on reverse is an indication of where these coins were minted. So, for example, um, a coin with um, 24 points um, could be minted at Berwick. 26 points could be Perth. Um, but that is a current hypothesis, but that is not... Um, that's not concrete. We don't know exactly where each of these um, these uh, coins were minted, um, and we don't know for certain if these com these um, combination of points on the Mullis of Stars actually indicated where these coins were minted either. So it's a bit of a mystery. Um, so yeah, so um, again, these coins uh, are probably one of the most common types of Scottish coins um, found. You know, across uh, across England, Wales, and Scotland, um, and outside of um, the UK as well, uh, they're commonly found abroad in hoards and in single finds. Um, so they did have a nice wide circulation. Uh, so um, as I mentioned, those um, Alexander's untimely death in 1286. Um, he was succeeded by John Balliol in 1292 when he was inaugurated or chosen during the after the great cause by Edward I to be the next King of Scotland. Um, so during that period between Alexander's death and um, his granddaughter, the maid uh, Margaret, the maid of Norway's death in 1290, and John's inauguration in 1292 um coins were con still continue to be issued in alexander's name it was only when john became king in 1292 that coins were issued in john's name and the, like alexander the second um um the types have a lot of the types have no mint name so the only one so the only uh, mint that is named on Balliol's coins is St. Andrew's. The rest of them all have the legend Rex Scotorum. So John's coins are divided into into two main types, the first rough issue and the second smooth issue. And um, I shall, and this slide actually shows you kind of like the, the difference between them. Generally, the, the first issue, the rough issue, is generally cru crudely produced. Um, the busts are crude, and generally the mullets on the reverse are have six points. Whereas on the smooth exam, on the smooth coinage, the second smooth coinage, the coins are much more better produced, and also the points on the mullets have five points. Um, so those were the, the two uh, main types of uh, John Balliol. And again, um, they were produced the same standard as the English coins and were circulating in England and Scotland and, of course, Ireland and, were and further afield. And they're also found as fines and as single fines and in hoards. So after 1296... John Balliol was basically overthrown at the start of the Wars of Independence when basically um, Edward I got tired of John Balliol basically standing up to him. Um, so he invaded Scotland and deposed, uh, and deposed Balliol and basically placed Scotland under the governors of the English crown. And in 1306, sort of, after several years of fighting, um, Robert Robert the Bruce 
reignited this fight um, and had himself basically crowned uh, or ignored, ignored, ignored uh, yeah, ignored, uh, sorry, I can't say the word, crowned um, King of Scots at Schoon in 1306 and gradually gained control of, the, of, of, of Scotland. And he took control of Berwick in 1318 and it is likely that the recommencement of um, Scottish coins started at this date because during the wars of independence with the breakdown of control and really weak political control in scotland there was no scottish coins produced between 1296 and roughly probably probably the early 1320s under under robert the first and robert's coins basically followed the the same principle as um alexander's second coinage and the coins of john balliol where it's a single cross with a, a mullet in each angle, with the with the legend Scotorum Rex. And Robert's um, Robert's types um, can be divided based on the stops between the words. And of course, this example is showing colon stops between the words and you know and where they are where they are placed. And um, um, so this one, type one, is the most common of um, Robert's coins. Um, Robert's, the coins of Robert's, Robert the, are not as common as what we see for Alexander the Third and John Balliol. Again, this may be because be because um, the mintage output was smaller. Um, we we don't know. And um, but they were still produced to the same um, silver standard as the. Uh, the English coins, um, and um, and still circulated in England and Scotland as well. So, following on from Robert, we now um, move into the reign of his son and successor, David II. And David's reign is really interesting numismatic-wise, um, as I'll talk you through. Um, so we start with his first coinages, um, which are thought to currently date from 1329 to 1357-58. So on his very first, um, his first coins, um, he only issued halfpence and farthings. And the date that these were issued is currently thought to be the 1330s. It's also worthy of note that in England during the 1330s and early 1340s, they only they only issued half pence and farthings too. But on these um, on these um, half pence and farthings, we have different forms of legends as well. So we have a, a legend of Monetary Regis, and then David. And then with the with the king's name with David's name on the reverse, so basically translating as the money of King David, and we also have the um, Rex Scotorum legends on these um, early half pennies and farthings as well. And in thirty in roughly about 1351, perhaps after a Parliament in Dundee, um, while David was a cat a cat a captive. In England, after he was after his capture at the Battle of Neville's Cross in the, in 1346, um, the Scottish regents um, Robert Robert Stuart and the government issued um, this this second issue of of coins, and this second issue um, consisted of pence and probably a very small number of half pence and farthings, and um, so this. Um, um, these um, these pennies, of which um, are, are are not as common as what we see for the earlier coins of of um, uh, Alexander the Third and Balliol, um, were produced in the name of King David, and um, currently they are currently divided into five main types based on my um, die study. Again, um, these coins do not name the mint on the reverse. Again, we have the Rex Scotorum legend, and it is currently thought that um, these coins were minted at Edinburgh, 
while the uh, whereas the the, the earlier coins of David, the, the, the half pence and the farthings, were thought to be potentially issued at Berwick before Berwick was lost during the Second War of Independence in the 1330s. But what is also interesting as well, that with the, um, with the pence the, issued from 1351 to 1357, that the Scottish coins were were subject to a temporary ban in 1356 when Edward, Edward III instructed his sheriffs not to accept these coins because of their deficient weight and fineness. And um, silver testing done um, by the Society of the Antiquities of Scotland in the 19th century shows that um, the silver content was actually the same as the corresponding um, English issues but what is needed is more up to date um silver testing to actually um to actually con confirm this um so this is the first sort of notion or documentary evidence we have of scottish coins being banned um from from england but conformity with the english coins was um renewed following David's release from captivity in 1357. So the first thing that David done upon the signing of the Treaty of Berwick in 1357, when he returned to Scotland, is introduced wide ranging uh, reforms into the Scottish coinage. And these reforms were based on Edward III's reforms to the English coinage in, in, uh, for, in the 1340s and 1351. So in 1357 or early 1358, David introduced Scotland's very first gold coin, a gold noble, and this was this was very very short lived, and it was so short lived lived that there are only four known specimens currently um, surviving. So such as this example here um, in the NMS collections. Um, so alongside uh, these, uh, this short-lived gold noble, David also introduced the groat worth for four pence and its half. And um, the design of these coins also changed as well, and I'll show you a couple of examples in a bit. Um, so the known active mints for David's second coinage, uh, which ran until um, 1967, were Aberdeen and Edinburgh. So um, these examples show uh, various types of groats under David II's second coinage. Um, we can see, again, we, we keep the same basic design, the single cross with the mullet in each angle, but we also see the, the, the resumption of the mint names on the reverse. And this is the same for all the denominations, so the groat, the half groat, the pence, and the half penny as well. And um, so David's second coinage, the silver, is basically divided into based on the style of the bust. Um, so he has several different styles of bust. Um, so he has four four main four main styles. So he has what's known as the young bust, which is the top example. He also has um, a variant of the young bust, which is Group B, which is a basically is a larger version of the young of of uh, the smaller bust used in um, in uh, Type A. And then when we get to type when we get to Type C and D, we have um, the older the older style heads. And type D is often what's referred to as the Robert II head. And the current hypothesis is that the Munia Bonagius or Bonagio was responsible for these um this Robert the Head style um uh, does, uh head under under late David II. Now Bonagius himself was an interesting character. He was a money at the Durham Mint at the Durham Mint in England, but then kind of like he got himself into debt, 
heavily in debt and then fled north to the border where he started working at the Edinburgh Mint. And it is probably roughly about uh, around about 1364 where we start to see him at the Edinburgh Mint. And it may be assumed that he was responsible for um, producing um, this new style, this Robert II style head that we see consistently through um, the coinage of Robert II. Um, it's also interesting to note as well that on these groats of coins, we also have various symbols um, between uh, privy marks between the um, between the words. So we have crosses, we have sal tires, and we have um, various other forms as well. And and um, we also have various other little marks as well in the field and on the reverse, such as pellets. We also have letter Ds as well in 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 some cases in in one of the angles too. So the, the the last coinage of um David II, his light coinage, was initiated in 1367. Um, due to the economic pressures in Scotland at the time, they had, and of course with David II's ransom payments to England, as one of the terms of his release in 1357, we also um, saw that because of this these economic pressures, the um, Scottish government was forced to reduce the weight of the coinage. So the, the um, groat, for example, re was reduced from 4.66 grams to 3.98. And this 1367 mark marks a watershed in Scottish numismatics in that it is the first breakaway um, from this conformity with the coinage of England, and um, and as we, and in a later session I will talk about that in in more in more detail. So these lighter coins of David were actually distinguished by an by a star on the scepter hand on the scepter handle or sometimes behind the head. And um, we still do get these um, coins found in England and and further afield as well, despite them being of a lesser of a lesser weight. And it's also it's also good to know that Edinburgh. It was only Edinburgh that minted these coins as now minting was becoming uh, more restricted to the larger towns compared to what we saw um, in the earlier period. Um, so when David unexpectedly died in 1371, he was su succeeded by his nephew, who became Robert II. Now, Robert II's coins, um, basically his bust style is basically very, is very similar to what we see on the later David II, hence why it's been given the later coins on David have been given the epithet of Robert the second head because it's basically the same the same head on pretty much all of um all of Robert's coins as well and again it is thought that the money uh, Bonagius was responsible for these and indeed on some of um Robert's coins we do have a little little b symbol behind the bus potentially um um, indicating that these co these coins were minted or and dyes were produced under Bonagius. So the Robert the coins of Robert II are pretty homogenous. Um, they are divided into various types based on the lettering, and I won't and that's that's normally um, quite complicated. So I won't go into um, that today for the purpose of this session. Um, normally, um, this classification only kind of works on the groats and the half groats because they're, they're larger. And on, when we get to the smaller denominations, such as the pence and the half pence, the lettering is often more difficult to see, especially when the coins are in not in very good condition. And um, so the known mints under, that were active under Robert II were Dundee, Edinburgh and Perth. 
And and unlike David, who spent most of his time in Edinburgh, the bulk of the government um, under Robert II and his successor, Robert III, was actually carried out in Perth. And that actually now brings us to the actual conclusion of um, of this sort of really nice, quick run through of the uh, of the Scottish coins of of this period. And um, what I have done here is produced um, a nice little sort of very basic bibliography of where of where you can look um, for more detail on the um, and more detail on the history and a lot more detail on classifications and images of of these um, of these Scottish coins. Um, so um, thank you very much. Thanks so much for that, Carl. That was really interesting and um, <laughs> some very funny looking <laughs> coins. <laughs> um, so uh, I know I have a couple of questions, but I see there's one in chat. If anyone else has some questions, please post them in the chat. Um, so the first question is, have any of the Scottish coins been discovered in any of the Isle of Man hoards? Oh, that is a good question. We do uh, know that Scottish coin, we do have single finds of, Sco of, of Scottish coins from the Isle of Man. Um, and I think there might have been one or two of them that might have had crescent coins in, or uh, the crescent coins of William the Lion. Um, but I will have to probably double check that one to, um, to, be, to be more accurate. Brilliant. Thank you. Um, just to see if any more questions come through, um, I'll ask some of my own. Um, did any of the different mints control certain denominations? Um, and, and if not, are there any metallurgical differences between the coins? Sorry, can you repeat that question, Campbell? I couldn't hear you properly there. Oh, sure. Um, <laughs> did different mints control certain denominations? And if not, are there metallurgical differences between the coins? Yes, yes, the, yes, they did. Um, not so much in the the early the early phase, um, but when we get the gold, when we get later on, um, when we get the gold coinage, um, it was only Edinburgh who produced uh, the gold coinage. So, and um, whereas under Robert the Third, we had Perth and Dumbarton also producing um, silver coins. Um, again, we have Ab Aberdeen producing groats under David II. We had Aberdeen producing groats and the pence. Uh, so it doesn't. It become. It's not so much um, the Scottish mints, you know, certain mints issuing different um, different denominations in this period. It, that's more of a feature for the uh, for the later for the later coins, for, for particularly during the reign of um, of Robert the Third where we see that and then it's kind of like after after the reign of through the 15th century minting really does get confined to edinburgh at, at, at that point but in in this period it's um particularly um pre dave the uh, second um when it was only really the penny that was being produced um in the known in the known mints there was yeah it was just really, it was it was just the penny so there was no sort of separate mint producing different denominations cool interesting uh we've got a question from john is there any evidence that the durand who minted for david the first is the durand who minted the first carlisle coins that is an excellent question and um i want to wish which one of wish i could um answer with confidence there is all it is always the possibility that he was the same person because we also have Derrent also issued um was also active at Roxburgh too. Um as we've got examples of coins in the NMS collection that have Derrent of Roxburgh on them. And as John yet yeah, you correctly correctly um points out that he also minted at yeah, he minted um, at De at Carlisle as well, because um, obviously we do have um, Erebold, who was the Carlisle money, who was minting in Edinburgh and Corbridge, and there is no reason why we why um, Derrand is not the same. Unfortunately, in this period, we have virtually no 
idea who these money is identities were the only one we know from certain from david the first reign was minard who is a burgess of berwick who then david the first um sent up to send to help sort of establish um saint andrews um and but also run um the saint andrews mint so he's the only real uh, money we have the identity for later in William's uh, under William the Lion's uh, reign, the money at Raoul was a silversmith who was responsible for the Dunfermline reliquary, or so so I'm told. And uh, unfortunately, I can't seem to um, find the reference for for that um, that identity of Raoul being being the silversmith. Um, yeah, so there's always yeah there is that possibility yeah there's always that, that that strong connection that strong possibility that Darren could have been also been on operation in Edinburgh and Roxburgh as well as Carlisle. Cool. We have a question from Dennis. Um, does anyone know why the French titles Escossi Rex made a brief appearance at the start of Alexander the Third's second coinage? um again no no particular no particular uh reason it could just be um a brief experimental type with um various legends we know that um the le ray willam was an experiment with um with various um french elements to um to william's scottish title and there's probably again no reason why um there was the um the, the sort of the, the french akossi rex um legend on the reverse before the rex Gotorum legend kind of um kind of took over so my guess is it was probably and current research suggests this it may have just been experimental with with a new coinage and um why we don't see a, a great deal of them um so they were probably issued you know fairly early on in um in 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 the uh, in the second coinage thank you uh we have another question from john is it possible that the very first scottish coins in the name of david from carlisle were minted up until the first treaty of durham after which they started to mint in stephen's name and then started to mint in the names of david and henry after stephen's imprisonment in 1141 after the battle of lincoln yeah that's a that's a yeah that is a that's a good yeah that's a good hypothesis and um so the the pretense with um with that is even though that david david had used the guise of supporting his niece matilda by taking carlisle by minting coins in david's name was actually a win for stephen because even though he didn't have control of carlisle um, with David and Earl Henry minting coins in his name, it actually meant that his legitimacy as King of England was actually recognised by David and Earl Henry. They weren't issuing coins in Matilda's name, but yeah, the um, the um, with the with the coins in Stephen's name, it is a good it is a good hypothesis that as Earl Henry and David actually gained more and more control over Northern England. They, they threw off this pretense, and um, the the um, the Battle of Lincoln Lincoln could be a good point where um, this, the coins in the name of Stephen stop from from Carlisle. But because we know so little about the chronology of um, this coinage. I wouldn't like to say for 100% certain, but it's a it's a it's a it's an excellent hypothesis, and it's a really it's a really good good idea. And there's enough to say that it didn't, but because we know so little about this uh, this this first Scottish um, coinage, it's hard to say for certain. But we do, and um, current research with some new varieties of um, coins of David the David the first. Um, particularly the um, one that recently sold um, through auction with the um, the tower or the castle on, and also we have one in the NMS um, collection um, with um, a palm sprig, could potentially relate these coins to 
the to the Second Crusade, which would push them, which would push the Cross Moline and List types of David later than what we first thought. But that is on that's ongoing. Um, the Crusader the Crusader link with um, these two coins is ongoing research um and it's still and that research is still kind of very very early early days so again yeah we don't we don't know that exact um that ex exact cr chronology same with the cross flurry issues and then the blundered issues the current what's currently written in literature is that the blundered issues were issued after david and earl henry died um, it's probably not as simple as that. Blundered issues were probably issued alongside the um, the issues that are that are legible. Again, we just don't we just don't know. What we need is a good hoard of these coins to really get um, to get a to get a sense of what was circulating when. And um, unfortunately, die studies. With the David the first coins are going to be quite complicated because of the often the condition that they that they're in, and I'm trying to, currently working through uh, all the David the first material in the NMS collections ahead of my um, my Silage on the um, on the Scottish on the early medieval Scottish coins in the NMS collections. Um, trying to do some die linking and working out a, 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 a basic chronology of a series of dies using the uh, the NMS collection. So, um, and then I'm hoping to potentially another way we can maybe potentially get around this um, chronology is um, silver testing. And we, me and some colleagues, do have an article that is coming out in this forthcoming edition of the British Numismatic Journal on the results of the silver testing of this early David the first border border coins uh, so hopefully that maybe the silver testing in the future could maybe with especially with the lead isotope analysis can maybe get us a sense of when maybe certain coins were potentially issued um, but again that is a that's a working that's a work in progress thanks Carl uh, Eric asks, what happened to Earl Henry? Did he die early or was he usurped? Earl Henry, unfortunately, he died before David. So he died in 1152 and before David died in 1153. And one of the hypotheses is, again, um, just going back to um, one of John's um, earlier questions about uh, the minting of, of in Stephen's name that one of the current hypotheses is that after Earl Henry died in 1152 that um, coins were issued in Stephen's name from Bambra and it, and it, and it could be that um, when Earl Henry died in 1152 and David not having a lot long left to live and um, peace between in England between Stephen and the future Henry II quite close the um it may have thought that the um that the scottish hold on northumberland northumberland or northumbria at least after henry's death was getting a little bit shaky so it may have been prudent to maybe start producing with the strong leadership of earl henry after after that vacuum that he created after he died in 1152 and with earl henry's son both sons both malcolm and William basically just children and that lack of strong leadership it may have been prudent to issue coins short-lived coins of from that Bamber mint in in Stephen's name but again that chronology that chronology is still not um you know 100% set in stone yeah so Earl, Earl, Earl Henry unfortunately died before before um before David which is why when David died in 1153 Earl Henry's son, Malcolm, became king. Thanks, Carl. Um, Benedict asks, when the weight was reduced for the light coinage onto David II and it uh -huh. deviated from the English standard, was there an influx of English coins of a higher silver standard? No, that is a that is a fantastic question and one of the which I kind of deliberately avoided in this talk. So my PhD, um, I've got extensive chapters in my PhD 
on that relationship. Basically, as um, I'll give you, the, I'll give you the simple answer. After um, 1367, English coins in Scotland started to decline. Um, so what we are seeing in the later 14th century, um, based on the hoard evidence that we're getting here up in Scotland. That English coins are not really present in co in coin hoards that uh, that were deposited during the reign of Robert II and Robert III. They consist mainly of um, Scottish coins of either Robert III, Robert II, or later David II. Um, so what we see gradually after 1367 is a de is the decline of English issues. In Scotland, though, as curiously enough, when we get to the 15th century, older clipped issues of Edward III and and Henry V and and Henry VI also start to reemerge in in sort of mid to late um, 15th century um, Scottish hordes. By which time, the Scottish coin, uh, the Scottish coinage, um, had undergone. Um, a lot of a lot of sort of reforms and was completely different to the english coins at the piece so older older english coins actually did make an appearance again in scotland in the 15th century but for the later 14th century they declined and vice versa in england um in the later 14th century we start to see the decline of scottish coins in england and there is um, ample documentary evidence that um, during the during the reign of Richard II in the 1380s, and um, that as the Scottish coins got lighter, the, their nominal nominal value was reduced. So, for example, the groat, the Scottish groat, which was circulating at four pence um, in the 1380s, was that in England was reduced to two pence, and then literally. After 1393, Scottish coins were literally just banned altogether from from England because they were produced to a much lighter standard and also a different silver standard as well. Yeah, so the simple answer is that after 1367, we start to see a decline of English coins in, in Scotland. Thanks, Carl. Lindsay asks if there has been any news recently on the whereabouts of Lord Stuart B's collection of early Scottish pennies that were stolen. Um, there has been, um, unfortunately, there'd be no news on that, but unfortunately, I can't divulge information that I am privy to until it's um, come, until um, the various authorities um, um, say more. Um, but unfortunately, there is no sort of kind of. I can't. I can't. I can't say anything on 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 that until until um, until future until until future dates. But from what um, I but I don't think there's any any anything new about about that um, about the location of unfortunately of that of that missing of those missing coins. Thanks, Carl. Uh, Jonathan asks, where did the gold come from for David II's coins? Was it mined in Scotland? That That is a fan, absolute fantastic question. Unfortunately, it's one I do not have an answer to. Um, I can um, unfortunately, because the Scottish coins haven't had a, a high degree of silver testing. And X, unfortunately, XRF can tell you the silver, the content but it can't tell you the silver sources. So if um, so, I'm going to go back to the coinage of David I here because um, I was involved in the project and the results are, are due to now come out in the forthcoming, this forthcoming volume of the British Numismatic Journal where we did do lead isotope analysis on the first coinage of David, of David I. And I can tell you that rather than what is conventionally believed that oh yeah all the silver came from the carlisle mine for the mints in scotland edinburgh roxburgh berwick that we tested it did not it was formed of a much wider silver pool that is that has very si similar isotopic analysis to the broader silver stock used across 
um, England and Wales. So rather than being targeted, so rather than just coming straight from everyone, rather than just saying, oh, yeah, it's straight from the Carlisle mine, it was not. And um, and the same can be said for um, probably the gold coin of, of David. Basically, what we need to do to determine the, the gold source is basically we need to do um, isotope analysis on on the David the Second Noble and also the later gold coins as well. We we know there was mining active in gold mining active in Scotland again in the 15th and 16th centuries. Um, so there is probably no reason to um, to su- to suggest that um, yeah this go- the gold source did actually come come from scotland but again we need to do um silver isotopic anal uh isotopic analysis to actually to try and determine this this silver source whether we can uh, this gold source sorry whether we can say for certain it was from a scottish source or it was part of a much wider um uh pool of 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 gold but yes that was a very interesting question And I think that seems to be all of the questions for today, Carl. So thank you again very much for your time today. Okay, yeah, uh, no problem. And um, with that, I will end the call. So thanks again, everybody. I was going to say, if anybody has any further questions, um, please do do feel free to email me and I'll do my best to, uh, to answer them. Brilliant. Thank you, Carl. Thanks, everybody. Thanks. Bye.